How's it going, everyone? Happy Wednesday. This is CCM Live. It is good to see you guys. My name is Marcus, and I'm your humble host. Uh, this is the show where every day at 8 p.m. Uh, East Coast, 5 p.m. West Coast, actually not every day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we are talking with Christian music uh, peeps, uh, people that are making Christian music stuff that you love, past, present, future, and uh, and throwing them your questions, too. So, hey, um, as always, I'm watching your comments. I'm excited to throw them up like Aaron's right here. There it is. He said jars of clay. There you go. Yes, indeed. And uh, so we're watching that. We're watching you. Um, hit share. You know, there's that little share button there. You're probably watching this on mobile. Uh, or tag somebody in the comments that you want to come. Maybe a big jars of clay fan. Maybe somebody who is uh, very uh, justice-minded and uh, and will benefit from the conversation we're going to have today. Um, this happens, and, and we have, you know, we get to do what we do because uh, we're we're doing it together. So, pop it in, and uh, and let's let's talk. Sweet, Katie. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you, Janelle. Thanks for being here. Um, we are. I, I am so excited. This is this is a cool like full circle thing for me now that I am. Uh, you know, I work with CCM. Um, it's been like a, uh, you know, it was a dream of mine when I was like 16 years old and I was listening to Jars of Clay and saw them on the cover of CCM magazine and all that stuff. And uh, so it, it's pretty cool to uh, to have the front man, founding member of Jars of Clay, Dan. Wait, I'm going to get it. Hassle time. Did I get it right? You got it right. First try. Awesome. Nice work. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, so not only are you, you know, known for Jars of Clay, of course, you are a, an author, a speaker, uh, of course, co-founder of uh, Bloodwater Mission. And, and what we're going to talk about today is a little bit different for those of you guys watch, who watch the show regularly. Um, we're, we're talking about we're talking about the mission. We're talking about uh, social justice and talking about the, the problems in the world and how to fix them. So uh, first of all, Dan, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but you and I were on like a like an indie artist panel together years ago in Nashville. It was that Pop Gun Entertainment thing where we had a whole bunch of people and we were like we were like the Simon Cowles judging. Do you remember that that whole deal? It was it was near the Gulch. Yeah, you're like yeah, I've done so absolutely. many of these. I, don't remember I do anymore. remember that actually. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's great. Good time. So, so in case you forget, forgot who I am. You know, so, now there you go. Yeah, we have history now. Good. Now uh, we now, now it all makes sense. Everything all is back together now. But it's all coming back. Good. Uh, well, you, uh, you've obviously like people are familiar with you through jars of clay, but uh, you've been keeping uh, quite busy with other pursuits that are not necessarily musical in nature. Just what does your day to day look like? Uh, now Boy, my day to day now is uh, so I'm a commuter along with right. everybody else in Nashville a little bit. So I. I work downtown at the Bloodwater office, uh, which is you know just here in Nashville. Um, it's a great space. We love it. Um, it's right in the middle of the heart of Nashville, um, nice. right by a few music venues. So it's it's a great spot. Um, but I end up getting down there, and and a lot of what my work is these days is is just telling people about the clean water crisis in Africa, um, and then uh, helping them figure out different ways that they can engage with it. Um, I think one of the big problems we have is that we're so aware of so many problems in the world, um, but we, we're we never usually given that many opportunities to, to actually get invested in them. Um, it's you know presented with problems and then sort of left hanging to be able to have a solution or be part of a solution. And so um, I spend a good amount of my time just talking to people about, you know, what are the ways that you know, an individual can can interact or intersect with the problem and make a difference. Wow, I mean, that's that's really empowering, and I think a lot of people will just hit that that compassion fatigue sometimes, where it's like you hear about all these causes and like, well, what can I do? And then you just kind of hold up and do nothing. What are yeah. so? What are some of the like? What is a practical thing that you will tell somebody? You know, someone like me who's you know living in the suburbs doing a doing a nine to five and how, how can someone like me be a part of blood water outside of, outside of just donations, which are important. Yeah. I, I the first thing that I usually tell people, and, and I know it, it's a big hurdle because most organizations and people just, you know, they need resources. So a lot of it is, you know, will help us fund a project, you know, help us 
by offering some resources to to this work. Um, and I think that's a great thing. But but honestly, I think fatigue happens because we're kind of inundated with information. I have a sense that we we don't get fatigued with the things that we actually know, with the people we actually know and have relationships with. Uh, and oftentimes, like we just know about problems that are going on. And, and so I usually tell people like the first thing, if you're interested in the water crisis uh, or interested in a certain place or helping a certain kind of person with their uh, finding a solution to a problem, then invest some time and energy into really knowing them. Like, like yeah. actually like turn off some of the other opportunities that you might have. Um, and there's so many and actually just sit in it for a while. Um, into that one thing and maybe just decide that you're gonna dedicate and commit to something, uh, to a story for maybe a few years or something, just so you um, you can actually know. And I find that in knowing people that are in the midst of the crisis, it, it helps you understand what the crisis really is, helps keep us from making a lot of choices that are our ideas and not mm. someone else's. You know, we make a lot of, um, assumptions when we step into the world of philanthropy or trying to help somebody else or social justice. Um, but what we really need to be able to do is just ask the question, you know, what do you need? How can I be a, a help to you? And you don't get that opportunity unless you take the time to invest in the community that you want to help serve. Yeah. Well, it's like saying you want to be friends with everyone and you're in, the, you end up being friends <laughs> with no one. You know, just digging yeah, in exactly. I, that that personalization and and really that personalizing of the the crisis in Africa is really what got you guys started. It was really making something as big of a problem as that, you know, more personal. You guys have you, you're still trying to do that, you, but you guys have changed a lot. You talked about you talk about an office. I mean, what uh, give us an update on on Bloodwater Mission now? You sounds like you guys have just grown by leaps and bounds over the years. Um, well, it's, it's interesting. Bloodwater's both grown and then shrunk and um, focused. We've, we've been around now for 15 years. And in that time, it is just, it has been a process of learning. You know, we were not development experts when we stepped into it. We we're musicians and artists who right. you know, had been given this idea that, um, you know, an artist's job is to look at the world and describe it. And I, uh, I think in taking that seriously, we stepped into this story of Africa and we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't, Bloodwater wouldn't be where it was unless we were aware that we weren't the experts in the room. There are a lot more smarter people than we were that were having the conversation, but we just came at it from a yeah. different, different way. Um, and so for the last 15 years, we, we, we had a lot of really great attention when Jars was doing a lot of touring and we were talking about it from stage and there was a, a, a massive platform to use to, to kind of break open this conversation. And then, uh, you know, in the last couple of years, Jars is, we made the decision to get off the road for a while, um, stop touring. We all have teenagers at home and <laughs> we wanted to be home with our families a little bit more. Um, uh, and that just meant that you know, the megaphone that we'd been using for blood water, uh, wasn't the same. And so, um, it's just meant that the organization we've had to really focus, but it's also meant that it's given us the time over the last 15 years to really develop what we feel is the right way, um, to step into development work. I think, you know, we we're like every other Western organization that in a lot of ways thinks because we have money, we think we know best what other people need and it's it's a silly assumption and uh we've tried really hard to not make that assumption um and so what that means is that right now blood water has kind of changed a little bit of the way that we work we provide clean water in africa through local organizations so we're not working through international aid organizations or larger groups we're actually finding the groups that live in these communities that are on the ground there and asking them, what water projects are you doing? What kind of work are you needing done in your community? And then we provide grants for that. Um, so that it really is coming from the locals. It's them, the people that when crisis happens, they're gonna be the ones that stay put. Everyone else will leave, but they're the ones that live there, right? So 
Um, so Bloodwater's work is really focused in on supporting those groups that exist in the communities. And that's really different. There's almost nobody that does work this way. Hmm. And then we do that. And then we also just provide those groups and those, uh, those small organizations with all the tools that they need um, to be educated in the areas where maybe the organization isn't functioning great where it might have some problems, where there's some areas where there's a lot of growth potential, like we can help them get to the place where they become the strongest organization possible. And then we can kind of go, all right, we're going to cheer you on from the sidelines now, like get to work and keep doing what you're doing. And uh, so Bloodwater does a lot of that now. So where it used to be, you know, fund a well and, uh, you know, put in a rain catchment tank in a community, now we work on these larger scale projects, but they're very focused on a, a ground level, community driven. Yeah, community building. I mean, that's yeah. it's awesome because it also doesn't look like it can sometimes where it's like these outsiders coming in and, you know, there's sort of reticence to, to accept that. So that's, you know, yeah. it's community building and community driven. So uh, there's you guys are seeing the website right there, bloodwater.org. You can learn more about it if you if you don't know uh, about it, or if you want to, to find ways to help. That's that's a good place to start. Um, so you guys are off the road. Jars is off the road. You're you're really pouring a lot of your time into what Bloodwater is doing. Um, what uh, what are some of the things that um, that you're seeing sort of outside of your realm that other bands or artists or creatives are doing well? to point to a particular cause. Who are, who are you seeing out there that's doing this right? <laughs> that's a great, uh, that's a great question. I'm, I can say that I've, I'm a little bit tunnel visioned in the way that I approach uh, <laughs> blood water. There are a lot of great artists that I think are having good conversations about different things and have stepped in to work with organizations. You know, I, I get as cynical as everybody does when they look at certain artists and you see like, you see big organizations sponsoring big tours and all this kind of stuff. You And it's, it's easy to wonder, you know, is there really a heart and a passion behind this or is it just, um, you know, is it just a sponsorship where they're getting paid to talk about something? And, um, and I actually have been really um, just encouraged that, that a lot of the people that I interact with that I that I talk to that are invested in working with an organization or basically said look I'm a musician so I'm not going to start something myself but I do want to have an impact because I've got a platform and um, that they really do care like they really do have a passion for what they're doing and I mean I look at groups that we've toured with in the past and artists like uh, Need to Breathe or um, like Drew Holcomb and uh, yeah. Ellie Holcomb and um Sarah Groves and some of these artists like that, or I just go, you know, they're, they actually have a passion for this and the organizations that they paired up with and connected with are doing great work and they care about, about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, one that comes to mind and Katie, you, you just mentioned that here uh, is Remedy Drive. I think that's, yeah. Um, I don't know. Are, are you friends with the, uh, do you know David, David Zock? Yes, I know David and I'm, I'm actually very, impressed with his passion and his drive for those sorts of things. He really is like his, his care for um, a lot of this, uh, sex trafficking and, um, and modern day slavery, any modern day slavery and a lot of the things that he's working on. Um, he's doing a really great job. I think he, it, it, it tends to just sort of ooze out of him and that's yeah. I think, how you know it's real. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, and he's dedicated, like that band dedicates all of their, yeah. their music music, you know, to this cause. It's, it's pretty amazing. So, so jumping off that, how you've been in Christian music, you know, like, like so many it's, uh, who've been in it long enough. It's this, it's, it's this love hate thing where it's, you know, there's this, uh, you know, when you become the, uh, one of the elder statesmen, you're like, okay, now let's do better with certain things. You know, yeah. I, I interviewed Kevin Max early in the program. I know he's a friend of yours. <laughs> yeah. You know, same, same kind of deal, but how, how from your perspective can Christian music do a better job of using their influence for, for causes, you know, for, for making a, a change in the world? Um, I think that it starts with telling the truth. Um, 
I, it's interesting. I had a conversation just yesterday with um, with somebody who was asking me, you know, how do I write really good Christian songs? Um, which is a very honest question to ask, uh, and and it was a very vulnerable and sincere question. And I I kept finding myself coming back to this idea of telling the truth um, mm. about who we are as human beings um, are being able to express a weakness is always the, an opportunity for someone else to resonate with that story and feel like they have permission to tell their story also. Um, and when people are telling their stories, it gives the rest of us a chance to connect with them and to maybe make a difference. And, and I just tend to find yeah. that for a lot of years, my biggest critique of, of Christian music was that it tend to lie to us all the time about who we really were. You know, the, the songs that really do express like, well, you get to know, you know, Jesus comes into your life and then things are great. Or, um, or like, we just don't get mad or we don't struggle with addiction <laughs> or we don't do any of these things or we don't wrestle. We're not narcissistic or we don't have, you know, sexual abuse or any of this stuff. And it just, it becomes less than human it becomes very alien and nobody can relate to that and and so i think it really starts in the christian community with songwriters being willing to be a lot more confessional um we see where god moves and intersects with people's lives when they are honest about the struggles that they're in the middle of and uh, uh and just being honest about their humanness and that's where it all begins you know we don't relate to people's strengths. We just get jealous and we get bitter. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, why you know, don't yeah. look right. And and people people are depressed because they're just looking at other people's highlight reels and going, oh, that's not me. And you know, Christian music would do that for a long time. Like they would just broadcast, and everyone would be like, oh gosh, that's not me. I don't feel that. So um, I just think it has to it has to come down to telling the truth. So of course, that's in the creation of art. So what about once, I mean, yes, that's, that's yeah. step one, mm -hmm. but then doing like what Jars has done and Remedy and Switchfoot and those guys, what, what kind of advice would you give to a, to a band that wants to, to somehow make a difference, that wants to align themselves with a cause? Um, well, the first question that when we were just getting started with Bloodwater, the question that um, a dear friend asked me was how long are you going to do this? Um, <laughs> and, and it was a great question because you you would ask yourself different questions when you engage with a cause, if you're going to be in it for a year or if you're going to be in it for 10 years. And you have to make that decision as a band. And artists are generally, I, I speak for myself in this, is that we're, we, it's the short attention span theater. We love moving from cause yeah. to cause to cause. And some of that is because we're always on the hunt for good stories and we want to find stuff to be able to write songs about and communicate through art. And so some of that, that thirst and hunger for that drives us to, to be very like short in yeah. terms of our engagement with things that are social justice oriented. Um, and I think that the reality is though, when you commit as an artist, to engage with a story, a slow and steady obedience in the same direction. Just start walking up the hill of, of a single kind of story and, and just commit to it. And I think that's, that's part of it. And, uh, you know, and then I think what will end up happening is it'll, it'll be part of the art. It'll be part of the conversation they're having yeah. with fans. It'll be part of their entire, like, process for for living and it'll be inspiring and the stories will be there uh, and the inspiration will be there and the ability to really have an impact uh, you know in serving the people that they want to serve right i mean you know sales and and uh and sellouts only go so far and this is uh this is much bigger what um what would you say uh what what happened in you that led to to all this. What that led to um, a really a fundamental reinvention of what's important to you. Um, my story, kind of my engagement with with Christianity and 
social justice, uh, kind of two things I would say happened in my life that were really important. Um, one, when I was when I was really young, I was I was ten years old, and I had a really really amazing, great friend. This girl actually that I had a crush on um, was killed in a car accident, and um, she was part of our church community, and I, um, I was just you know, broken as a kid. I had never experienced that kind of pain. I had never was so confused by that kind of um, sense of loss. And, and that was one of the things I brought the, all of my questions about that suffering to my church community. And as a nine year old, I wasn't very aware that everyone was also reeling from that yeah. loss, but I brought the questions to that, all my pain to them. And and mostly what I got back was, you know, kind of the, the platitudes, the, right. well, she's in a better place uh, kind of things. And it just didn't speak. It didn't touch that pain. And I made a decision at that point as a kid um, that m at least I got to that point where I said, well, maybe God doesn't, maybe God can't speak to my pain. And that kind of became the question that I started asking as a kid. And so I really engaged with Christianity, even through my youth group years and beyond and all that kind of stuff with that core question going, can God really speak to suffering? And how do we as Christians uh, engage with suffering in the world and in our own lives? So there's that. And then the other piece is just, you know, my parents divorced and, um, and I know that's, that's a common story. Uh, and it, and I think growing up with, with parents that, that were, always kind of in that centrifuge being pulled apart. Um, I was that kid who wanted to keep things together. And so yes. I was constantly pulling opposing ideas and opposing people back together to try to like say, Hey, what about these views? <laughs> yeah. Maybe they can actually, there's something in the middle here. And that has fueled so much of what jars is so much of the connection to social justice has been about um, connecting people who live in different cultures or have spent their lives patting themselves from the suffering of the world, trying to get them to understand how incredible it is to actually put yourself in harm's way, you know, and just all of those sorts of things, but it's always about connection. And so Bloodwater was just, it was just a further extension of that. The music was always about that. Every, I have my theory that, you know, every songwriter tends to write the same song over and over again. <laughs> like if you listen to an artist's career, they, they kind of have, there's a central theme, a question, a puzzle, something they're trying to unpack that they, they don't get right. They keep trying to rewrite it and get it right. Um, and mine is always about connection. Mm. I love the answer to that question because it is, uh, because what I was gonna ask is how would you say your calling has changed over the years? But the truth is it hasn't at all. I mean, it's always been about connection. It's always been about yeah. uniting. And it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's been about those uh, speaking to that pain. And I think that's, uh, that's pretty neat to see, you know, whereas from a bird's eye, you know, some people will go, whoa, he's, you know, like he's not doing music as much and he's doing this. And like, yeah. I wonder what, you know, has he thought his callings changed? And, and really it's just new expressions of that. I think that's really cool. Yeah. And um, it's seasons, right? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I have no intention of stopping as a songwriter, as an artist, uh, as a singer, like I have, uh, I think it just kind of comes in seasons and, you know, jars were in that place now where we're, we've been together since we were college sophomores. And so we, we finally just said, Hey, there's probably parts of our personality, some strengths that we have that we've kind of abdicated to other people, or we've let kind of lower, you know, it's like a family, like you've got certain characteristics that, that you don't, really nurture because somebody else in your family does it better, you know? And, right. and so now when we're all, the four of us are in different places doing different musical projects and creative things, we're learning things about ourselves and some of the things that we let kind of lay slumber. Now we're actually seeing come about and going, Oh, this is interesting. I actually really love doing this thing also, which is going to make for a really exciting, um, kind of reunion when we come back together to, to work in the studio and start working yeah. on music again. But there's no, no plans at this time, right? I mean, a lot of the comments that are, that are being said right now are all these questions about that. Yeah. Um, currently we don't have a plan to jump in the studio for a full length album. We, um, you know, we, uh, the only thing we have currently, like we've been doing some, 
private shows for blood water, like fundraisers. And we do a Christmas show uh, on December 1st every year in Franklin, which is world AIDS day. Um, and so we just launched, uh, we just put tickets up for that. And so that's, that's kind of all we're going to be doing this year. Um, as far as we know, who knows, you know, the guys may come back together and go, Hey, well, we'd kind of like to do a song or something. <laughs> yeah. But I imagine you've been songwriting nonstop regardless. Cause that's just, that's just an, you know, it's like breathing. Um, what, how has really this new season affected the way that you write music or what you write about? Yeah, it's had a huge effect actually. Um, I've, I've actually had, we've, things have slowed down enough to where I can actually watch music documentaries and start learning a little bit more from my musical heroes and people. And I've been watching a lot of documentaries and seeing how other artists have, have navigated the music world. And then I also, um, I co-led uh, a songwriting workshop recently with, um, uh, with um, a, a singer songwriter named Mary Gaucher. And it was one of the most eye-opening and inspiring weekends it was just with the folks that aren't professional songwriters that were mm. trying to write and learn what what does it take to have this craft of songwriting and i actually uh, there's so much about telling my own story through music and and actually being vulnerable and honest in the lyric writing and i feel like i've, I've tried really hard to do that but yep. there are those moments those choices you that i've made as a songwriter to instead of going deeper in i've kind of backed off and made some really flowery kind of metaphor happen or something. <laughs> and I realized that I, that what I would like to do is, is to have the songs become more, more vulnerable, more descriptive, more vivid. And, uh, and so all of this time off has definitely benefited me as a songwriter. It's, it's given me some new tools in my belt and um, I can't wait to kind of get back in with jars at some point and, see how it all uh what it what it does to that kind of writing yeah i mean uh it looks like uh katie here said something about it she wants a cruise there you go jars of clay cruise he said he would think <laughs> yeah. about it i think I mean, there's a cruise is all the rage right, right now a right? kayaking opportunity at some point that somebody mentioned <laughs> kayaking cool. cruise it'll be awesome uh, before I get to just a, a couple of the questions here, um, give us give us some some cool stories or, or something recently you've heard out of Africa that's really inspired or encouraged you uh, through yeah, Bloodwater. You're, you're, you're catching me just uh, just a couple weeks. I actually leave. I'm heading to uh, Ethiopia and Uganda in just wow. a few days. I'll be there for a while to to meet some folks um, and see what's been happening with with a lot of our work there. Um, a lot of what I've been hearing about that I've been loving is um, the way that communities are being empowered right now. Um, like one of the one of the communities we're working with, they it's in a, this very kind of mountainous region, or there's lots of hills, and there are communities that are up on the top of the hills. And what's happening is the water that they're using and all the waste comes down the river. And the people that live at the bottom are, are having to collect that water and that Ooh. kind of stuff. And that's what they're using to cook and clean with. And when Bloodwater just started working with that, that community, like they've been, they, they were just, in a, I mean, it's a lot of really sick people because, mm -hmm. because they really are like, they're left to use water. That's, that's really is poison. Um, yeah. And, and since we started working with them, they've been developing things like, they're planting trees so that erosion doesn't happen as rapidly. And the stuff that's on the top of the communities doesn't come all the way down and, and contaminate the water sources down below. And they're, they're teaching us so much, but it's, it's, it's meant that people have been a lot healthier there. They have access to clean water now and they didn't before. Um, we've been working with a group up in Ethiopia in Northern Ethiopia that was started by college students. Mm -hmm. And um, and just being able to work with students to impact a region where it's like 60% of the population doesn't have access to water. Uh, and it's crazy. I mean, I don't even know, can't even imagine that. Gosh. And uh, yeah. But to be able to be in those places and, and um, just the transformation that happens uh, is, 
is stunning. Uh, and, and that it's, it's life changing. Way, yeah, and because of the way we work, it's just, it's a very human kind of transformation. Like it brings dignity or, or it doesn't bring dignity, but it affirms the dignity of these people that that is sort of buried under all of those people basically saying, you obviously don't matter because no one's helping you out. No one cares about you. And then we get to come in and go, Oh no, no, you know what? We, people do care about you and here's what's going to happen because of that. And, um, that You're speaking is, to their pain. Yeah. yeah. Right. And okay. it, it's just, it's just a really amazing thing. And I, every day I think I still feel just ultimately privileged that, that I get to do this kind of work because, because yeah. it's not in the artist's description, right? You don't have to be doing this. Right. You can, I could just be writing songs and making music and that's amazing and fun and, and challenging, but, but there's something about just the fact that God has saw fit to put, this group of guys and and this organization together um it's been amazing are all of you guys involved i mean on a on a pretty constant level yeah yeah fairly uh i mean the other guys are doing a little bit more on the music side i'm the only guy that goes into the bloodwater office every day and, and works yeah. um but the other guys are are you know they're they're always available to it you know it's the kind of thing where if i asked them to if they would do something charlie's created some soundtrack music for videos we've done or oh, nice. and they've all done like they they're leaving their families and going across the country to do a, a a house show for the organization stuff like that where you know they're very willing they still believe in the work yeah they're in it well uh, i've got a few well more than a few a lot of people watching a lot of people uh have questions yeah uh, my mom my mom wants to know if you have a dog she asks this every episode so there you go <laughs> i actually just put I have two dogs. They're golden doodles. Um, oh, nice. About 75 pounds each. So they're oh. larger dogs. They're pretty loud. I just put them upstairs because I didn't want them to, to bark through the interview. <laughs> yeah, I think mine was um, was barking uh, fairly recently. Uh, Katie wants to know, uh, you have another band called Paris Something, she said. And she also wanted to know uh, if you would do a, a song with Hanson. She discovered that you worked with them at some point. Two, yeah. Yeah. Two uh, I do have a, another side project. Um, it came out a few years ago. I worked with Matt Bronloway, who was the original guitar player for Jars of Clay. And yeah. He and I have collaborated a lot over the years on on stuff for Plum and other our other artists. And we did a record with our good friend Jeremy Bose. All three of us went to college Greenville together. Awesome. Um, called the Hawk in Paris. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a really it was kind of a, an experiment at first and we love doing it. And so we still do music as the Hawk in Paris. And, you know, we put out a few things. We've actually been able to create instruments and do different things. That <laughs> are, it's been a nice creative outlet on the side, but uh, yeah, it's kind of a synth pop trio. It's fun when you can do that and you don't like, you care obviously, but you don't care about the results. You just make it cause it's fun and you just want to try stuff. Like that's awesome. That's freedom. Yeah. If there has ever been any good result from the fact that people aren't really buying music much anymore, it's the fact that you can take the need to make money off of your records right off the table and it <laughs> doesn't become the motivator at all. So you can yeah. just be making music that you appreciate or love. <laughs> yep. That's it's honest though, right? Yeah. Uh, and Jeff Hanson, said, "Oh, oh sorry. I'll, I'll answer the, the Hanson question. Um, I love the guys in Hanson. They are some of the most talented guys. And most people, when you say Hanson, they immediately go back to three little little kids. Um, but yep. they really are some of the most talented musicians. They've grown up, and they're they're amazing men. Um, and I've had the privilege of writing with them uh, quite a few times, and." And I've put some different things together with them. Nothing that's ended up on a, an official record, but you can, if you search for it, there's there's records or songs that we've been a part of. That's awesome. Yeah, they are they are mass talented, and and you know everyone tends to know them for one song, but they've yeah. they've got a lot, a lot more than that. So, yeah. Katie, that's your favorite band. So there you go. <laughs> Our Hanson shout out for you. Uh, Jeff said, "Hi Dan, I attended Greenville with you and appreciated hearing you in concert last year. Thanks for your work to serve people in need." So yes, all right, a fellow Greenville. Hi Jeff. Personally. Yeah, awesome. And then uh, and then 
it. Let's see, scroll, scroll, scroll. Um, yeah, uh, curious to see if there are any new children's books in the future, Joe wants to know. Hmm, well, I just finished, we just put one out called Lulu and the Long Walk uh, that you can find. It's, they're really hard to find. I'm not much of a business manager. I love making things and I hate <laughs> giving people access to them to purchase them. It's a problem. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and, but I, uh, uh, it's available. Um, Joel Schoon Tannis, who illustrated my first children's book, illustrated the second one. And this one, uh, it's available through his website. You can buy it there. Um, but it's the story of a little girl who goes to collect water. Um, and it's too heavy. And so animals help carry it back with her. And it's just a great conversation starter for parents to, to use with their kids to talk about something as difficult as a water crisis. That's good. Uh, it's awesome to be able to, to spark those discussions early on. Oh, yeah. Uh, we, we've invoked the name of Kevin Max on the show, and some uh, David had a question. Any chance you would ever record or collaborate with Kevin Max? You guys would be awesome together musically slash vocally. Yeah, we've, we've, uh, um, we've entertained the idea quite a few times. I, I sang on his porch uh, a few weeks ago. Um, as part of this thing called Porch Fest, uh, and just did some covers with him, and yeah, I really I respect Kevin. He's he's just he's just so terribly creative, and is constantly like his output of creative projects um, puts me to shame. And I actually thought oh, I worked man. pretty hard for a long time, but he's he's far better he, than I am. He is prolific. That is yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and he he is. He is honest in the moment. And I mean that in the best way. Like, he's like, I'm totally into this style, you know, this lyrical choice. And he's all in. And then he's like, now we're going to do something completely different. And I'm all in. Right. And I just love it. That's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's be great I, I, I always tell him, I'm like, yeah, man, I'd love to just let me know. I'll jump in on a project with you or do something like that. And he's usually, by the time I get around to working with him, he's on to the next project and then the <laughs> next one. Yeah. I just yeah. moved too slowly for him. <laughs> it's a raging yeah. river. Um, so Gerald, uh, just this is just a comment. He's from uh, the Philippines. So that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Welcome, Gerald. Thanks for watching. And he says, Manila misses you jars of clay. Oh, so there you go. We miss Manila also. We have a, uh, a recorded concert from Manila that has yet to be uh, released that we hope someday we'll, we'll reach everybody. Wow. It turned that's out awesome. incredible. Yeah, we love, love Manila and all our friends there. I'm sure that's a part of the touring life that you do miss is the international um, touring, you know, just because it's such a different, different mission, different vibe, different focus even than touring the States. Yeah. 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 And it, I, it still amazes me. I'll still hear from people from countries that I've never even heard of. I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, we, we have your record and we've been listening to you guys for a while. It's, it, yeah, and doing shows in places where people don't speak English, but they're singing back our songs to us, like that kind of stuff just, yeah, it boggles oh, yeah. the mind. It's amazing. Yeah. It's wonderful. Oh, absolutely. And then uh, final fan question today. Thanks, everybody. Emmanuel wants to know, how about a solo album? Um, it's, I've been thinking about it. Yeah, I can't confirm anything just yet, but I, um, yeah, it'll probably it's happen. Possible. It's very yeah. possible. I'd All right, say well, an eighty percent chance. So, which is pretty high. <laughs> awesome. Well, something we like to do while we have people on here is just, uh, is just, just lift them up, just pray for them. So, while oh, yeah. you're here, we'll do that. You guys watching now, later, it all works the same. So, let's do it. Well, God, thanks so much for Dan. Thanks for Jars. Thank you for a calling that was uh, made pretty clear very quickly from you uh, to step into people's pain. And to, and to bring people together. Lord, that's something that's near to your, and dear to your heart. So, Lord, we just pray for the mission of Blood Water and, uh, and, and for Dan personally and, and for Jars and what, what you have for them in every season uh, to, to express that calling. And so, uh, so, God, just with this trip coming up, we pray for uh, safety, for incredible stories, and for lives to be changed. And uh, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, yeah. Uh, thank you, my friend. And uh, so those of you guys watching, uh, you haven't, uh, if you missed the link earlier, there you go, bloodwater.org. Learn all about it. And uh, and if you've, you know, if you know of a band that, or artists that are doing something good, you can write them in the comments, but I would say more importantly, support them 
and uh, and cheer them on for for doing you know important work uh, around the world and and uh, that that changes lives. It's bigger than music, although music's a great place to start. So yeah, thanks, Dan. We'll have you back uh, when that solo album releases in the Kevin right. Max. Uh, Kevin Max collab, uh, and I'm sure he'll do a rap album at some point. Oh boy, and, uh, <laughs> I think he's familiar with that genre, yeah. You know, or Zydeco. You know, he's he's <laughs> yeah. toying with everything right now. But yeah. all right, well, thank you, and uh, we'll be we'll be watching what happens. All right, thanks a lot. Take care. Yep. All right, everyone, that's it. That is uh, that's our show today. And if you guys missed some of this, it'll be on. Uh, be on replay as soon as we're done. Uh, we're also on YouTube, CCM Magazine's YouTube. We're on the website, ccmmagazine.com, and we have a podcast. So if you look, uh, if you're in the Apple podcast area, you search for CCM Magazine Live, uh, you will find it. And, oh, yeah, Pamela, great comment. I'm glad you said this before we go. FYI, you can support Bloodwater through Amazon Smile. If you don't know what that is, uh, smile.amazon.com. Basically, they'll give a little bit of your purchase towards an organization of your choice. It's awesome. You don't even have to do anything. So, uh, Katie, glad you loved the episode. You guys got to come back tomorrow. Uh, my friend Katie Hurst, those of you who followed my, my previous show know uh, um, that I've interviewed her. She's a blast. And uh, she's the new, I think the newest. No, I think Peabod's the newest. Well, one of them. We had Peabod on the show. The other new uh, singer on uh, Centricity Music is Katie Hurst. She's got that song, How Can I Be Silent? Uh, it's, it's a blast. So, uh, tune in, same time, 8 p.m., Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, and we will see you then. Bye, everybody.